Hi. Welcome to Artist and Critic. I'm Don Gray. Uh, I'm very pleased to uh, have this pro uh, program originate from Santa Fe, New Mexico, and equally pleased to have uh, Dory Ashton, the eminent uh, art critic, with me here for this program. Uh, she's in Santa Fe to take part in a seminar and to speak at the Museum of Fine Arts here in this very beautiful, very cultured city. Dory, thanks very much for being with me here. Pleasure. Are you enjoying the city? Or are you too yes, newly oh, yes. arrived? Yes, it's very beautiful here. It's the, uh, the architecture really the, uh, reminds me of, we were talking about Sedona, Arizona, reminds me of some of the rock formations. It's so organic in, yes. its, in its forms. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to be speaking about uh, issues in contemporary art criticism. H have you formulated as yet what some of those issues are going to are in your mind, uh, if not for your speech, just generally well, speaking? Well, in general, yes, yes. I, I think that there are um, quite obvious problems that uh, art criticism has become far too arcane, too dependent on theory, and uh, has borrowed from too many other disciplines and has gotten much too far from, from the objects with, which it's supposed to be contemplating. It sounds like you're almost describing contemporary painting. I mean, <laughs> has the painting no. echoed the criticism, or is the no, no, no? You know, in in every epoch, there are plenty of good artists and critics. We might we might add. No, there aren't plenty of. Oh, good there critics, aren't. No. <laughs> well, what uh, what's causing this uh, deflation in the insights of art criticism then in this time? Well, on the broadest level, I guess you'd say that there's something seriously wrong with our culture, and then. The art world is just a little reflection of the grand world, and what's wrong with the grand world filters into the art world. Um, Dora, you just stepped right into my web here. <laughs> no, go ahead. <laughs> uh, um, in, in my, I, I feel that uh, society is, is obviously having major problems, and basically, I suppose, in a sense, a, a loss of purpose or in life or a sense of meaning in life. I, I feel that m many people are just really kind of floundering after these things and all of the horrible statistics that we read about seem to be ample evidence of that. Uh, isn't there any way for either the citizenry or the critics to transcend this uh, kind of numbing sense of maybe it's nothingness or lack of meaning in life, lack of direction? Well, I yes, of course, I think there are many ways and I think one of the problems with art criticism is that just as art criticism has become too remote from what makes people want to be artists, which has a, inevitably an idealistic uh, purpose, I believe, I still believe that, uh, I think in the, in the world itself that's also the same problem. That uh, If there were a culture in which certain values were esteemed, uh, we could rest more easily. Well, it's, it seems to me, uh, <coughs> the way I've, I've always perceived this, and I, I tend to think of it in relation to artists rather than critics, but I, I, think, I think it's probably pretty easy to connect the two, is that it seems like there's been a continual breakdown or, or erosion uh, in terms of the uh, significance of art and the quality of art mm -hmm. as it uh, moved away from um, a significant relationship to nature. Uh, in the late 19th century. I, I often consider, for example, the comparison of, say, what Van Gogh and Cezanne were doing, and then you go another step with what Picasso and Matisse are doing, and they're abstracting uh, a, a degree from reality, and then perhaps you go to Kandinsky and Mondrian, and you see this complete removal from nature and reality and something really concrete to get a hold of. Not saying that their work isn't significant, that they weren't searching for spiritual things, but it seems like progressively, and you come into the m modern age, if you want to use, say, Schnabel or Warhol as an example, uh, and then you look back at Van Gogh and Cezanne, and you feel this, this thunderous sense of substance of the form of nature and reality, plus this tremendous individual creativeness and uh, originality. And then, and compared to the more recent things, it, it feels somewhat thinner and, and more decorative, or in the sense no, of I Warhol think, cartoony? No, I, couldn't, or I could never agree with you. Really? Certainly not. 
the problem, especially since you cited certain instances, what you've done is you've simply exposed yourself to a system which has put before you a certain number of things and you've accepted that and you, you decided to call it art. And that's the mistake. And it, just because the Whitney Museum has a certain kind of an exhibition doesn't necessarily mean that that's the gifted artist in our midst. And that's, one of the, that's exactly what I mean. That, those are the values that uh, people uh, must be alerted to, that you simply, uh, the critical spirit is something, has nothing to do with art critics. Critical spirit, critic, the notion of being a critic is simply a notion of being civilized. The idea that you question life and things in life and values. So if you were questioning values in general, you would then also question values in the arts. And there are artists, and there are very wonderful artists in our midst. They don't necessarily, uh, they are not thrown upon this great screen right. which Americans are, uh, are given, this surrogate product. Uh, and its critical spirit would say, no, that, that isn't it. That's not it at all. Yeah. Well, isn't that one of the problems, though, that the critical spirit, I think the critical spirit says that, but in terms of public awareness of art, uh, our heroes are supposed to be the Schnabels and the Warhols mm -hmm. because they are the ones that are receiving the, the hype, shall we say, mm -hmm. without any critical commentary. And they're the ones that are exhibited, as you say, in the Whitney or the, oh, but in or those, the Metropolitan. Yeah, so those international circuses have nothing to do with art. Of course they don't. But, but these are the, the societal stamps of approval mm -hmm. that if you don't know anything about art, you say, well, gee, what is the Museum of Modern Art? Just had well, a that's big just what I mean. Because that's what's wrong with that. the culture. Because we, mm. uh, we, don't have a, uh, we don't have a central point of view of existence, a philosophy. We don't have an education for people who, are, who could be educated toward higher values. And so it goes throughout. It's not only in the arts, it's through in everything. So that I, f I, f I believe the, the problem is grander than just the little uh, ghetto, which is the art world, <laughs> uh, that, that, yeah. which doesn't matter much anyway. There are, will mm -hmm. always be artists born and poets. And the, the examples you gave, you mentioned uh, you seem to f feel is a diminishing spirituality and, and reality uh, because in the 19th century. But you have to remember in the 19th century there were also highly abstract artists like the poet Mallarmé. Uh, and yet I, I think Mallarmé was an extremely important figure for all of us. And not everybody can understand him, but that doesn't matter. He's there. He's there in our culture. And that's true of those artists you mentioned. It's also true of certain contemporary artists, not necessarily the ones that are, that are, are uh, invested in or, or uh, pronounced uh, stars and so on. And we all know Mr. Warhol was right. You know, you can There's be famous for five right. minutes in this country. <laughs> and uh, but after all, you could hardly say that an artist, let's say Mark Rothko, was less uh, meaningful than a 19th century artist. He meant a great deal to many of us. I know, and uh, what, what I'm uh, wondering about is if, if uh, wh where's the balance point then? I mean, do, do you see a dilution in the art? Uh, maybe I should differentiate two things since you're, you're, you, you seem to be suggesting that. Is there a dilution increasing dilution of the significance of contemporary art, or is it, generally speaking, not saying that there aren't good people in it, but, or is it just the illusion of, of decay, shall well, we say, because of there, that, there's the, the no decadence. There's no answer to that, the, because I still believe that, as, as they said in the Renaissance, truth is a daughter of time. We, we won't know that, uh, certainly not in our lifetime, but later generations could look back and say, oh yes, that was a decadent period, there weren't many good artists, or possibly, that's possibly so, but I rather doubt that. There's almost no period you could look back to where there weren't artists of significance. You know? It seems though that sometimes the, as you say, according to the time and a, a historical reevaluation, some mm -hmm. of the artists, I think you said earlier, there were good artists that 
perhaps we don't hear as much about that they're not part of the oh, hype that's machine. Certain. That's certain. That, that they'll they may, survive. That, well, they may be the cream that I rises to the top and, and so forth. I think you can assume that. Uh, what, what will it take uh, an economic collapse or <laughs> catastrophe of war or some other slap in the face uh, to, to kind of reorient us as a society or, or individuals to a, to a, a, a deeper perception of, of truth and whether it's artistic or just life truth. I well, mean, I'll get away from the arts then and I'll speak about something which I think affects the arts. Until the people, if you're talking about America, North America, until the United States takes stock of its ethic, until they stop assassinating other and murdering people elsewhere uh, and living the fat good life, I don't think that you can have any kind of uh, reckoning with with anything which deals with high values as the arts must. Uh, in other words, till they allow people in Nicaragua to survive and, and so on. I'm wondering if uh, the problem might be for um, technological societies everywhere. If there's some some something in the technological so society per se that mm -hmm. alienates the citizens from the government or or it, it really almost all modern societies are corporate states in a You're sense. You're wrong. You see, that's a, that's a very uh, uh, Eurocentric, uh, United States-centric point of view. Two-thirds of the world is not living in that technological society. Right. Two-thirds of the world is living quite differently. And this tiny little proportion of people that have, what do they call those things they cook in? I forget. Microwaves. Microwaves <laughs> and, and, and permanent waves and everything fires. else. Uh, this is, you know, other people are just living lives and barely living lives. So that, that, that is where the reckoning comes. You must always think of that. That's why uh, these people are so remote. The theoreticians, the, 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 the people that uh, are getting into the campuses now, the books that the, the, the students read, the professors and all, they're, they're living in, in a fool's paradise. Well, and I'm a professor, so well, I've, I've I'm a one, fool too. I, I've been one myself. I suppose we all partake of the good and the Ill's, ills of academia. But, well, th that's what I precisely I was referring to, was, was the, that segment of the world that is technologically oriented. You know, well, no, I, 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 I had a it. chastening experience yeah. last uh, uh, one year ago. I went to see the Third World International Exhibition in Havana, and there were about 120 countries represented, and there were 2,800 works, and these all were works of people who lived in societies that had nothing to do with my life in New York City. And I had to, uh, it was very good for me to see that. What was the level of the art? Were they influenced by well, it, the again, Western example it would, or the it would, technological it example? Would, there or? were some uh, that were and others who weren't. Uh, there was a great variation in talent, in, in, uh, in the nature of their cultures, in aspiration, in what they would consider worth doing as an artist. And uh, this great uh, diversity was impressive. And, and there were some very impressive artists, too. I wonder if they'll ever uh, surface Be seen and here? become part of, the, uh, part of the machinery of the art, our, our art well, world. Well, some of the Cuban artists have been exhibited in New York, uh, and they tend to be oriented toward North America. Uh, and some of them are very good. Uh, um, just switching gears uh, to a small degree, but. Uh, um, in this uh, sense of disrupted values and a certain loss of, of direction and critical truth, as you call it, w where does the valuation of $53.9 million on the recent Van Gogh irises <laughs> fit into this in terms of spiritual or lack of spiritual values or confusion of values. I mean, how, how can... Uh, I think it's, uh, it's certainly unfortunate uh, and a disaster that um, works of art have become commodities to that degree and that uh, pe groups of people, uh, cartels buy works of art and so on. But I, I really believe it has nothing to do with art. And, I, and most artists I know 
uh, don't sell works in auction and uh, are relatively unaffected by those things. However, it certainly has a, it throws a pall upon us. I think we're all very depressed about it. Well, why specifically are you depressed? I mean, from just what you've said, or well, is there something else? Well, it's a debasement. It? It's a debasement of the meaning of a work of art, clearly. But you know, there's a long history of that, and uh, artists have always survived patronage of one kind or another, and I think they'll survive this too. It it when when I think of the realities of Van Gogh's life, yes, which can kind it's of, an irony, isn't it? Oh, it's 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 a terrible irony, and it's it's almost more a horror. Mm -hmm. uh, a horrible irony. I mean, here, here's this man who, it, you certainly know the story, and I know the story, mm -hmm. I'm sure most people in the audience know the story, but, but r really treated with either great indifference or outright hostility, and hanging on to life as long as he can, and then just giving out, really, I, I, I think. I mean, he just felt that he couldn't, uh, mm -hmm. there was no way that he could possibly survive under those conditions, and to have that reality now become a myth of Van Gogh in our time and this this fantasy response really I mean it's like it's like in a world of mm -hmm. of nightmare or mm -hmm. absolute insanity to have something like this say, happen. I, I, probably it would not have affected him had he been alive because his problems were much more profound and had nothing to do with all of that it had nothing to do with him well, I, I think that's almost maybe the whole point of our discussion and kind of what, what I, I felt our discussion would be, you know, knowing some of your feelings and thoughts, is that there's, there's kind of, uh, a, 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 there are fundamental truths in life and values that, that give meaning to life and art, and we may disagree on the shadings of what those values are, but they, they have things that, they are things that, that transcend really kind of our narrow human egos and the limitations of our times and 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 go toward all time you might say I mean there's sort of a continuing human spirit at least I feel you know that that mm -hmm. that's uh, continually alive and always has been and the closer we come to that the more true our work is whether we're artists or writers or mm -hmm. or uh, supporters of art and and it really seems that we've uh, that's what we're talking about we've lost sight of and, and so we, we go off we, we get involved in so many different aberrations and there's so many uh, really kind of sad manifestations of, of people who have uh, that were just simply missing the point you know and we get lost in in, in perversities and superficialities and, and, and artifices mm -hmm. um, is there anything that you would like to say at this point that I haven't asked you? I mean, maybe I'm steering you in some way that <laughs> no, isn't. Uh, no, no, um, I think I've. <clears throat> maybe another example of, of what we're talking about and, and uh, concurrent with your appearance here is the opening of the Thomas Hart uh, Benton exhibition at the Santa Fe Museum of Fine mm -hmm. Art. And uh, he, he has uh, always struck me as, as really kind of an archetype of the 20th century situation in art and maybe in life, wh whether a person likes him or respects him as an artist or considers him just uh, absolutely mediocre. And, and it seems that around his volatile personality, all these opinions attach. And uh, I'll ask you in a minute what, 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 what your personal feeling about him is, but, but I thought I'd uh, just read a quote that he, he wrote in 1911. It's very brief. Uh, which kind of seems to sum up this sense of of a society and art that that uh, lost touch with itself. Uh, he wrote, uh, "It seemed to me that I must make a choice. Uh, either I would paint in the realistic tradition of Western art, with some kind of identification with the natural world, and thus risk being unprogressive, or I would throw the new movements I would follow. I'm sorry, the new movements toward an unknown goal." a goal which a number of far-sighted critics were already saying might turn out to be an empty square of paint. Um, well, he was a Philistine and a bad artist. You think so? A very bad artist, yes. I isn't I he don't think what he has to say has any interest at all. Really? Did, did you if he had talent, I would say, if he were a true rebel, curmudgeon who refused to accede to the demands of, of the avant-garde and so on, 
but he was just an ungifted man. Couldn't draw. He was a very turgid painter, and uh, and he you, you, you and he, he propped up his own ego by saying all so? the other people were no good. You think so? Oh, that's that's an interesting. <laughs> uh, no, I I thought that that, that he had uh, something to say in terms of color and maybe in terms of saying something. I couldn't about agree with you less. He was a terrible colorist. Y yeah, about the only thing he does have is that it was that he was Jackson Pollock's teacher. That's for really okay. And, and yes, he was very kind to Jackson Pollock and tried to help him over he was, rough spots. He, he was yes. very supportive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And in some uh, degree, uh, I guess he represented a, a kind of an aspiration, but I'm afraid I don't think it was a very uh, healthy one. You don't think he reached it? Well, see, uh, I, I guess I have the feeling that one of the problems in modern art. Uh, in the 20th century, um, aside from its, uh, well, we, we can talk about its, its major contributions and some of its problems. Uh, I think a lot of blind alleys were, were, were created, in a sense, uh, through uh, a natural desire for experimentation uh, plot based upon, I think, a very serious uh, desire to find spiritual truth and really, in a sense, almost an escape from an intolerable world. I think my my point of view is, and I think maybe you that's what you're saying, is that really almost life in the 20th century has been so bloody intolerable. And so oh, no, I would never you, say you, that. You wouldn't say that? Every century is intolerable. It it's, hasn't been increased because of the uh, mass societies and we the Great Wars. We may feel that way. The, we may feel that way. I, for instance, I happen to be a Jew, so I am particularly sensitive to things like the Holocaust. Right. And that seems to me unspeakable, and, and one can't comprehend it. And yet, even there, there were artists. And, uh, for instance, a friend of mine, uh, they found an opera that a, a very fine composer, whose name I don't remember, uh, composed in Theresienstadt. Mm. And uh, it was performed in London. A friend of mine did the sets, and he told me about it. So those are those unspeakable things, but unspeakable things have always happened. And somehow something has emerged. The human animal seems to survive these things. Somehow. I don't feel yeah, at so. all, and I never would would arrogate to myself mm -hmm. the right to, to say, oh well, you know, uh, there's a diminishing quality, or this is escapist art. Or, no, I, I, I have too much confidence in, in mm. uh, people's ability to express things, and how they express them, uh, it seems to me, varies greatly. And even in any given decade in the 20th century, there's been an enormous variety of mm. expression, an and, and intense expression. Uh, Malievich was, a, I think, a very great artist, a very expressive artist. And so was Max Beckmann. One used the figure, one mm -hmm. didn't. The, the mode does not say uh, what the artist is. It's, an artist is a mysterious, m art is a mystery. And mysteriously, some figures emerge who, who, who compel us and continue to compel us. I wasn't thinking of it so much as escapist art in that you know, kind of negative connotation, but I was thinking of it as art that, that, as all significant art must, that reacts very strongly to its time, its environment, its mm -hmm. problems, and its uh, good mm -hmm. aspects. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it struck me that, you know, for example, you, you talk about... I'm not the, even sure about that, by the way. Oh, you don't think so? Well, I tend to think so, but I'm not sure that there haven't been these strange figures who literally lifted themselves out of their epoch. You mean like, say, Bosch or Ryder or sort of, are you well, thinking of visionaries or just no, not necessarily? not necessarily. Just Certain kinds of temperaments that are possibly not that much uh, connected to their moment. Um, <clears throat> someone was telling me that there's been a, re a book, uh, apparently fairly recently, by Mr. Tuckman, the director of the LA Museum, on visionaries? Uh, no, not on visionaries. I'm I'm changing the subject rather quickly oh. on you here. Um, no, on uh, he he felt uh, the premise as described to me is that uh, 20th century art people have been interpreting 20th century art as 
overemphasizing the aesthetics of it and missing out on the deeper spiritual aspects, which I think you were implying when you're talking about Malevich. Um, have, have you, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but have you read the book? No, because I, haven't. I think I there's a catalog for an exhibition. Oh, was it? Yes, Did he, I think so. Was he making any uh, groundbreaking uh, or breakthroughs in terms I of I haven't read it, so or? I don't know, but I think it's a fairly often encountered point of view, yeah. Oh, okay, good. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe in conclusion we could say, uh, we still have a little time left, that uh, have you ever read Alexander Solzhenitsyn's uh, mm -hmm. 1978 uh, commencement speech to Harvard, at Harvard? I read it, yes. W what was your assessment of his assessment of us, where he, he saw us as, I think, kind of lacking moral courage, and particularly the uh, leaders of society, which we could apply both to our society and to the art world, and that uh, there was no official censorship <clears throat> in society, but only the fashionable ideas entered the arena or the universities or something. I mean, what, 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 what do you feel about that? I think that uh, what he said was in general true, but the way he said it, uh, I found, I, I don't, Solzhenitsyn to me is a, kind of a throwback to the czarist era. Uh, he'd be perfectly comfortable with, with a well-organized czarist regime, I think. And uh, his idea of spirituality is a 19th century idea. I feel he is not, uh, he really doesn't cope with, uh, with the issues that would come up in a society such as this one, which has uh, traditions quite different from the ones that he would uh, mm. recognize. Yeah. So there's some truth in what he says, but you feel it's covered, uh, colored by his uh, yeah, background. Yeah, his experience, and, I think, know. makes it almost impossible for him to understand mm. the nature of this society, which, after all, is not monolithic. It is mm. heterogeneous, Multi. and every time you throw up your hands in despair, something occurs in the United States that makes you say, well, you know, this can happen here. Mm. Dory, thanks so much. I think we're out of time. We, I really appreciate you. Thank you. Uh, being with me in the wonderful city of Santa Fe, uh, we've been talking to Dory Ashton, the eminent art critic who's here for a few days from New York. This has been Artist and Critic. I'm Don Gray. Thanks so much for watching. Bye-bye.